I'm Rob Skinner, and this is the Rob Skinner Podcast. Today, I continue reading from my book, How to Plant and Grow a Church, A Complete Guide for Small Church Growth. The chapter deals with a church planter's marriage and family. Listen as I discuss the power of building a family feel in your church, how to find joy in your marriage, the secret ingredient of a happy marriage, how to not freak out when your wife says, we need to talk, how to balance your passion for the mission with parenting, what one thing 5,000 successful families all have in common, and how to have great family dinners. All this and more on the Rob Skinner Podcast. Welcome back to the Rob Skinner Podcast. My goal is to inspire you to live a no regrets life, make this life count, and multiply disciples, leaders, and churches. Hey guys, the CLIMB Conference is coming up November 30th. It's going to be in Dallas, Texas. Have you registered yet? You really need to be there to get inspired, get tools for growth. People like Joel Nagel are going to be coming with a full toolkit of help for you as a minister, as a ministry leader. You're going to go into 2024 fully ready with a full calendar and a a preaching plan. I mean, he is loaded for bear. He's going to be so helpful. You'll be able to listen to people like Sean Wooten, Kevin Miller, Dave Bliley, preach the word on how to grow your ministry and yourself. We've got so many good speakers, so many gifted people who are going to help you to grow spiritually and to grow your ministry. And you're just going to get encouraged by being around idealistic faithful followers of Jesus. Register today at robskinner.com if you haven't already. I'm looking for a leader, a team, and money to plant the Green Valley Church in September of 2023. Green Valley and its neighboring city of Sarita are some of the fastest growing cities in the state of Arizona. It's just a booming, booming area. I want to share this. There's been a couple driving all the way up from Green Valley with Karen Kalarik, whom I I interviewed a few episodes back. And nearly every Sunday, not joking, one or both of them will cry after the lesson. They'll come up, they'll squeeze my hand and say, I needed that so much. Thank you so much. And they'll thank me for preaching the word to them. And they are fired up and they're so eager to get baptized in the next several weeks. And so when I see the passion, the desire for God in their face, I think we need a church for them and people like them. There's so many people that are hurting who want to hear the gospel, who are, are open they're just waiting for the good news. They, they're waiting for the people to present the word to them. And that's why I'm looking for a leadership couple, team members, and money to plant this beautiful area of Arizona. If you're interested in leading or going on a mission team, email me at rob at robskinner.com. If you can't go on the team, but you'd like to support the planting with a tax-deductible gift, click the link in the bottom of the show notes and select the general fund option. Chapter 6, The Church Planter's Marriage and Family Marriage and family will be a church planter's source of strength or Achilles' heel. If your marriage and family are close and connected, you'll remain refreshed and will attract others to imitate your lifestyle. However, as mentioned earlier, the extremely focused and driven nature of the church planter can drive his marriage and family into the ground if he's not careful. Use the power of your family to build a family feel. The millennial generation is proving challenging to reach. In reading books on strategy to save them, I've picked up some paradoxical tips. This generation that surpasses others in technical savvy, distrust, and relational disconnection is attracted to low-tech, authentic, and real family relationships. The unique strength of a church planting, the family atmosphere, is what many millennials are desperately looking for and the key to winning them over. You don't have to have the latest sound and light show. However, you do have to have a remarkable love. This starts with your marriage and family. In churches under 100 members, your example in public and private has an outsized impact on your church and those attending it. People absorb and assimilate not only your teaching, but also your likes, dislikes, 
personal habits, and life patterns. They see your strengths and weaknesses. You'll see this from time to time as members roast you at Christmas banquets. I can still do a fair imitation of my campus minister. The vibe you radiate from your marriage and parenting parenting interactions gets picked up by those around you. Even if you're the most loving person in the fellowship, if people see you interrupt, cut off, or roll your eyes at your wife or kids, that's how you'll be known. Your behavior becomes a standard for interpersonal relationships. I've seen ultra-talented church leaders and preachers disappear after having a stellar start to their career. Why? They had undealt with family troubles. Don't let it happen to you. Use Sunday evenings as family time devotional for campus ministry. Shortly after our campus ministry couple was hired away from the church, Ashland Church Planting, we were at a loss to know what to do with a thriving campus ministry. We put the students themselves in charge of the campus ministry. I led a discipling group to give direction, and we started inviting the college students over for a family-style dinner on Sunday nights. That turned out to be a great decision. Instead of tanking, the campus increased its momentum and continued baptizing. I attribute it to the power of a loving family environment and good food. We would gather around 5 p.m. and sing a song or two. Pam would make a great dinner with help from some of the students, and then we'd have a short devotional lesson from one of the campus leaders. The rest of the night was an open fellowship. We kicked everyone out at about 9 p.m. If your wife is willing and enjoys hospitality, a dinner and devotional night for your team or campus ministry is powerful. It knits people's hearts together and shows that you are a family person. Find joy in your marriage. I could write another book on marriage, and there are already thousands of them out there, but I'll limit this to my perspective as a church planner. The first and most important habit to develop is that of regular relationship maintenance for your marriage and family. It is so tempting to skip the mundane and seemingly less important work of consistent conversation, family dinners, and weekly dates with your wife. It's so easy to tell yourself and your wife, we'll need to push our date off for next week because Bill, who's studying the Bible, is only available tonight. Everything can seem like an emergency in the church planting stage. Struggling young Christian, a dating couple falling into immorality, a team couple getting into a marital fight. If you don't set a boundary around your marriage to protect and maintain it, something will come up every week to keep you from strengthening it. I learned the importance of regular maintenance a few years ago. One of my sons was moving back from being away at college. Because he hadn't maintained the car I lent him, he couldn't drive it home. The brakes were shot and it was too dangerous to drive. I decided to have the car towed from Georgia to Arizona and have it repaired with a mechanic I trusted. When the car arrived at my mechanic's house, he just looked at it and shook his head. He told me it was going to cost about $800 to fix. Now, that was on top of the over $800 to get it towed across the country. I thought that would be a good time to give my son a quote-unquote life lesson. I looked him straight in the eye and said, Son, you need to learn to take care of the things given you. He was humble and apologized. We climbed into my Toyota pickup and headed back home from the mechanic's house. As we merged onto the freeway, I heard a sound like someone shaking a metal toolbox full of nuts and bolts. As I was wondering what that strange sound was, the truck lost power, and I coasted it to the side of the freeway. I had it towed back to the same mechanic's house. We left it there, and a few days later, I got a call from him. Rob, um... I remember when you bought this a year ago, you asked me to come out and look at it before you bought it. I told you then it was a good used truck, but it was going to need an oil change soon. Did you ever get that oil change done? I mumbled something back, and then he said, Anyway, when I opened up the engine, there was no oil in it. The engine was bone dry and burned up. It's going to cost $2,500 to rebuild the engine. I weakly returned a thank you, and hung up the phone. I had bought that dependable Toyota truck and hadn't changed the oil. I changed the oil in my other cars, but never got around to checking the oil level or taking the truck in for maintenance. I ended up apologizing to my son for hypocritically ignoring my own quote-unquote life lesson. 
Making the same mistake with our wife and family is so easy to do. They seem happy, stable, and dependable. They won't scream or freak out if you don't give them the time they deserve. Compared to your other relationships, they seem so healthy until they break down. If you don't give them the best of what you have to offer, at some point you will pay the price, stuck on the side of life's highway, wondering how your family got into such a terrible situation. What can you do to avoid this? Date every week. Weekly dating is a staple of nearly every marriage retreat I've ever attended and every marriage book I've read. It's so obvious that it, that it seems stupid to bring it up, but ask any man whether he should change the oil in his cars and he'll scoff, roll his eyes, and say, duh, to you. There's a difference between knowing and doing. You must commit the time and stick to it. We've, t- we've tried different nights and Fine Friday usually works best for us. After, after a busy week, it's a welcome break from the grind. Others are also going out, and I find it difficult to enjoy myself Saturday night before I preach on Sunday. When people ask to join us for a birthday party, Bible study, or counseling appointment, I'm deliberately vague. Hey, thanks for thinking of me. Unfortunately, I have an appointment scheduled for that same time. In time, people will figure out what you're doing, and they may tease you, but behind the joking will be hidden deep respect. You honor your most important human relationship. Pray together. August 19th, 1990 is the day Pam Wilkinson said, I do, to me and is one of the best days of my life. I still remember looking into Pam's eyes as the minister shared his his ideas on building a solid foundation for marriage. Rob, pray with Pam every day, he said. I nodded compliantly, yet thought in my heart, that's dumb. I'm not going to do that. The only thing dumb about that was my stubborn refusal to listen to good advice. After a few few years of being married, I realized I had no idea how Pam was really doing spiritually. When I tried one day to gently bring something up that I felt she needed to work on, she came at me like a cat in a cat fight. I realized that my lack of attention to her spiritual health was creating problems in our marriage. I started then and I'm still working on the daily work of sharing our spiritual life. By the time we planted the church in Ashland, Oregon, we had developed enough of a habit to go out on regular prayer walks. We cried out to God, and He heard us. I might be the only man who feels this way, but when my wife starts sharing all the things she's concerned about, I feel like a two-ton concrete plate is descending on me. She often wants to share these things right before we're going to bed. She loves to detail problems in the church and our family. After going through her worry checklist, she feels great and drifts off to sleep. I feel miserable and feel like I'd better do something and am responsible for fixing every worrisome situation she's highlighted. It wasn't until we started regular prayer walks that I found relief from the pressure I felt. When we would go outside talking to God, Pam would be praying to God and sharing all the very same problems that she'd shared with me before. However, when she was praying and talking to God, I noticed that I could listen and not have the same response of impending doom and dark clouds that I felt when she would share them with me. 1 Peter 5.7 says, Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. When Pam casts all her anxiety on God, I feel far less anxiety, and I still get, quote-unquote, relational credit for being a good listener. She still feels unburdened and listened to by God and me, and we're stronger as a result. If you're tempted to run away when your wife says, we need a talk, try responding by saying, okay, let's go outside and talk to God. In addition to a regular date night and prayer with your wife, make time for frequent daily dinners. I used to feel tons of pressure as a young dad as older ministers would talk about having family devotionals together. I thought, another lesson to prepare? And do they know what my kids are like? They won't sit still for 30 seconds, let alone 30 minutes. It wasn't until another minister recommended combining family devotionals with family dinners. He said, we used to have family devotionals, but they almost always turned into family correctionals because all we did is spend time correcting our kids to sit still or listen. It wasn't until we combined dinner and devotionals that things improved. After that conversation, I started our family dinners with a prayer and one scripture that I read. 
we talk about it and then have the kids share what they thought about it. Over time, we were able to get them to share more than one word answers. We grew into having the kids share their highs and lows from that day and then sharing things they felt like the family or members of the family could improve. Family dinners have morphed into one of the most sacred and satisfying pillars of our family. It's a time to reconnect, recharge, and laugh. Carve out and protect family meals together. Turn off the TV. Turn in and turn off phones. Tune in to one another, and over time, your family will grow in love and warmth. What about the kids? The most common response we we got when we arrived in Tokyo, Japan in 1993 was shock at our willingness to move overseas with a six-week-old baby. Our oldest son, David, had just been born in San Francisco, and we sold everything and took him on his first mission trip to Japan. He and his younger siblings, who were quote-unquote made in Japan, treasured the 10 years they spent in Japan. I see a disturbing trend in our society and churches. Parents are increasingly child-centered in their decision-making. Many Christians are more child-centered than they are Christ-centered. I see talented disciples turning down opportunities to start churches or lead new ministries because they're worried it'll impact their kids negatively. I can understand this if your child has special needs or if your marriage and family is weak, but to ignore the call of God because your kids are in a soccer club is indefensible. We moved back to the States in 2003 and then moved again to plant a church in 2004 in Oregon. While our youngest two kids were in high school, we moved to plant a church in Tucson, Arizona. All three kids became Christians and view their childhood with fondness. As an example, after 10 years of being overseas in Japan, we were offered a position in Boise, Idaho. We loved the city and the members of the church. I had tried to get hired in my home state of Oregon, but nothing was available at that time. Boise was the nearest city to Oregon, and I had a few relatives in the area. However, this period was turbulent in our family of churches, and there was a wave of drama sweeping throughout the churches. Boise was no exception, and although I hadn't been the cause of trouble, I was caught up in the wake of past conflict and grievances. After being there for about a year, I tired of the constant drama and considered it an unhealthy situation for both my family and me. The board cut our salary 25%, and with three young kids and a mortgage, staying became financially untenable. As I agonized in prayer about the church and our situation, I started thinking about my dream to plant churches in Oregon. The atmosphere of confusion and introspection going on within our fellowship had created a leadership vacuum. The direction of our churches was unknown and doubtful. I chose to view this as an opportunity rather than an obstacle. In the past, executive leadership chose which churches to plant and allocated resources accordingly. Large and mid-sized regional metropolitan areas were naturally targeted based on their population size and significance. I had already planted a church in the largest city in Oregon, Portland, but I wanted to build a church in my hometown of Ashland, Oregon, population 20,000 people. The surrounding county population was 200,000. Most people confused Oregon with Ohio or Iowa, and if they did know where it was, the only city they could name was Portland. The Medford-Ashland area is stuck exactly five hours south of Portland and five hours north of Sacramento, California. I knew that even if our previous leadership structure in our family of churches had been in place to direct missionary growth, the area I targeted wasn't even on the radar. I counted the cost. I prayed. I talked to my wife endlessly. I realized that although I would not have the traditional financial backing, I had a green light to plant a church near where my family lived, if I was willing to shoulder the risk and step step out on faith. Really, at that time, there was no one to say no. Like crossing a busy street, I looked both ways, and seeing no traffic blocking me, I loaded up our U-Haul trucks and moved to Oregon. At this same time, I was talking to friends in different churches who cautioned me about my plans to plant a church with no team, no money, no support, and no children's ministry. I appreciated and valued their input. One old friend encouraged me to move to a much larger church in Seattle for the sake of my kids' spiritual health. There was a large and established children's ministry that they could participate in and would have built-in friendships with kids their age. I wrestled with this and talked it over with Pam many nights. 
I was reading a book from John Eldridge entitled Wild at Heart. As I was reading, a single quote stopped me. He said, don't ask yourself what the world needs. Ask yourself what makes you come alive and go do that. Because what the world needs is people who have come alive. When I thought about the two options, there was only one that made me come alive. I could return to a large church, a church that I had, that I had led in the past, but I think something in me might have died. The thought of a big challenge and planting a church where there was none filled me with a thrill I find hard to describe. I felt deeply that my passion and engagement would influence my kids far more than any other factor. With that thinking, we chose the more difficult road, and I've never regret, regretted that choice. Once we arrived in Ashland, we worked hard at making sure our kids participated in regional camps and activities, and they visited their friends and churches as much as we could afford. They all ended up getting baptized in the following years. We were tested again in this area when asked to plant a new church in Tucson, Arizona. In January 2012, I got a call from Bruce Williams asking me to consider planting a church there and going back into the professional ministry. At this point, I still had two kids in high school and one in college. My middle son was in his junior year, and my daughter was a freshman. When I floated the idea to my two kids at home, they cried. They didn't want to leave their friends. I told Bruce no. But we kept on thinking about it, and the thought of a new planting with the added benefit of financial support got me excited. After praying long and hard about it, we finally said yes, and we all moved that summer. It was difficult at first. My son, who has always made friends easily, spent many lunches his senior year sitting alone in his new high school's cafeteria. My heart broke as I saw the toll it was taking on him. My daughter, on the other hand, quickly built a circle of friends. That school year, my son and daughter started a Bible discussion during lunch, and we'd bring pizza to attract their friends once a week. Starting with just the two of them, they eventually had an attendance of 27 kids. Through their outreach that year, they helped one classmate and two sets of parents become Christians. When they finished high school, they enrolled at the University of Arizona. Looking back on their transition, they're both glad God called them to Arizona. We couldn't couldn't see it at the time, but it was God's plan for our family. Our kids learned to sacrifice for Christ, and they were able to participate in a new mission venture as young disciples. Both are glad that we decided to leave Oregon and don't have any regrets or resentment toward us for the decision we made. If you're wrestling with a decision to plant a church but concerns about your children's health is holding you back, I can't offer any scientific evidence or case studies to support my convictions. You'll have to make that call. However, I've always felt that your kids imitate the passion and power that radiates from a father's relationship with God and his sense of mission and purpose. I've seen many middle-aged men who sacrificed their dreams on the altar of security. They traded their hunger for God only to be choked out by third soil suburban living. I don't want that. If you've read this far, I assume you don't want that either. You'll need to get advice, pray, and take a step of courage in the direction of your dreams. Family Vacations While planting a church in Fukuoka, Japan in the late 90s, I read a book from Gary Chapman called The Five Love Languages of Families. In the book, Chapman mentions a study of 5,000 families that he conducted. He was looking for factors common to all good families. He had difficulty finding events or habits shared among all good families. The only activity common to all good families was camping. That was all I needed to know. I immediately bought sleeping bags and pads, a tent, and other related equipment. We took off in the 600cc delivery van that I picked up for $100, and we enjoyed a week vacation in the sweltering July heat and humidity of western Japan. Since that time, we've camped through dramatic thunderstorms, heavy rain, and even camped on New Year's Eve in a dormant volcano. Although each one has not been perfect or easy, nearly every trip became a memory that forced us to pull together and talk with one another. Regardless of how busy you are, force yourself to take the time to be with your family. Now that I have kids who are in their 20s, I'm so glad that we have those memories to look back on. 
Don't let the emergencies of your church keep you away from carving out time with the people you love the very most. Family dinners. If there were one single panacea, one thing, one tool that helps the most in building family, it would have to be regular family dinners and meals. Dinner is the time that your family talks, reconnects, shares, prays, and gets to see, see each other. Find yourself a round table so that you can all fit around and make family dinners a treasured and sacred tradition built into your family life. Family dinners need to be focused. Growing, growing up, we had regular family dinners, which were good. But my dad would line up his seat so that he had a clear view of the tel- television, which typically was showing Tom Brokaw on the evening news. I'm really glad we had the time together. But if I could go back in time and make one change, it would be to turn the TV off when we are eating together. The issue is so much more critical now as every mem- member of your family has his own channel to watch on his or her cell phone. Texting, messaging, and scanning the phone will hollow out the impact of your gatherings. Your family will be there physically, but they aren't really there. Their mind is elsewhere. Demand and expect a no phone, no media rule at dinner time. Your kids will buck. Your wife may grouse, but stand firm until it becomes accepted. Have your kids turn in their phones at dinner. They're experts at covert monitoring of their phones. Make dinner regular. Family dinners need to be consistent to develop the compounding effect you desire. The average American father talks with his kids only seven minutes per day. With your limited time as a church planter, you're busy both before and after dinner. If you don't make this time, your family can easily go a week without any meaningful conversation with you. Intentional. Once you start having regular and focused dinners, it's time to think about making them memorable. You don't have to overthink it. Just have a dedicated, scheduled time free from distractions. But you do want to include prayer, discussion, sharing, and scripture reading. I've heard some parents have their kids share the news that they read about during the day. Ask the kids to go around and share their high and low for the day. Family dinners are a versatile canvas for discussing family rules, standards, settling disputes, making summer plans, encouraging and comforting one another. You can do almost anything during the golden hour of mealtime. Thanks for listening. Here's how you can help support the program. First of all, hit the subscribe button and please send a link to your friends. Let them know about it. Secondly, read and review one of my books. You can find them on Amazon. First of all, it's How to Plant and Grow a Church or Courage, How to Make This Life Count. Thirdly, support the program financially by clicking the link in the show notes and selecting the general fund. Your tax-deductible gift will help me multiply disciples, leaders, and churches. Because my goal is to inspire you to make this life count, to live a no-regrets life, and multiply disciples, leaders, and churches. Have a great day, and make this life count.